Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here. Welcome to Leadership Voyage, the podcast dedicated to your pursuit of becoming a great leader. My name is Jason Wick, and welcome to Season 1, Episode 7, with author and talent retention consultant, Dr. Troy Hall. Now, don't even think about skipping this episode, because there is a lifetime of leadership advice in this conversation with Dr. Troy Hall. Featured on the Today Show, ABC, the global BV TV network, Beyond the Business Radio Show, and CEO World, Dr. Troy Hall is an award-winning talent retention consultant, international speaker, and author of the best-selling titles, Cohesion Culture, Proven Principles to Retain Your Top Talent, and Fanny Rules, A Mother's Leadership Lessons That Never Grow Old. As the founder of the trademarked Cohesion Culture, Dr. Troy has dedicated his career to establishing a cycle of culture wellness in the corporate and professional sphere. His executive coaching is built on the strategic framework of cohesion culture, making the concepts of belonging, value, and shared commitment easy for organizations to adapt and implement. From the U.S. to Canada and the United Kingdom, from the Middle East to Africa, Asia, Europe, and Australia, Dr. Troy has spoken at global conferences as a subject matter expert on the topics of culture and leadership, strategy, and change. Now, in this discussion between myself and Dr. Troy, we talk about how we can start to take the culture we already have in our organizations and infuse cohesion into that culture. This is based on many principles, depending on how you're looking at the situation. But I really encourage you to get engaged in this discussion, because I know for myself, I I am uh, thinking of a million things I could do next after uh, hearing the great researching and findings, conclusions of Dr. Troy. Season 1, Episode 7 with Dr. Troy Hall talking about a cohesion culture. I am here with Dr. Troy Hall, who has taken a few minutes out of his busy schedule today to spend some time here in Leadership Voyage. Dr. Troy, really, really nice to meet you this afternoon, and thanks for uh, for spending a few minutes with me. I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. I'm happy to do it. We're here because... Uh, We're talking a little bit about a cohesion culture, which I think we'll all be very familiar with by the end of the discussion. And your book, Cohesion Culture, Proven Principles to Retain Your Top Talent, uh, written a few years ago. If we could try to level set for everyone out there a little bit, could you explain what a cohesion culture is uh, in your own words? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. It'd be better than if I used your words, right? <laughs> it would be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So r- realistically, when we talk about cohesion culture, uh, what what it is, is it's the trademarked program that deals with three strategic elements of cohesion, belonging, value, and shared mutual commitment. So we talk about a cohesion culture, but I don't want folks to get all worried and thinking that uh, what we're trying to do is uh, convert them so that they become little minions, you know, here's their <laughs> cohesion culture. It's uh, the opportunity is to infuse cohesion into their culture. And cohesion has the great properties. It's a causal phenomenon, meaning that's a cause and effect. It helps retain talent because individuals not only feel like they belong, like they're someplace special, but they feel included. Uh, they have value, meaning they know what their work is. It's meaningful and purposeful in what they do. They understand upstream and downstream of the of the things that they're involved in on a day-to-day basis. And then the shared mutual commitment, and that really stems when leaders effectively commit to their focus on others first and then self. And it gives us a great beginning for those mutual commitments to occur. So the cohesion culture, by definition, is a safe workspace where people have a sense of belonging, value, and shared mutual commitment. Yeah, thanks for outlining those three elements. When you talk about um, belonging, how do we help someone get that sense of belonging within our organizations? Well, 
the first way that you can do it is by how do you greet people? So it's kind of where I start when I'm working with a client, my, my job or my role and what I love doing is guiding leaders to retain their talent by helping them infuse that cohesion into their culture. And before I get to that, I wanna just clarify that you still have your own culture. It's a culture of joy, of innovation, excellence, achievement, service, sales, whatever it happens to be is still your culture. All you're doing is overlaying those strategic elements into it to really infuse it and give it that that needed um, you know, nudge that it sometimes uh, requires to bring yourselves to a new level of performance. Because when you have cohesion, you have performance. When you have performance, you have engagement. So all of that you know, kind of comes around together. So why don't you now team me up and ask that question to me? <laughs> Thanks for that explanation, Dr. Troy. And how do we help someone get that sense of belonging? That sense of belonging will come a little bit with the greeting and the interactions that you have. I firmly believe that in organizations, it should always be connection before content. Hmm. And there is an, uh, a responsibility for the leader to know that their role is to motivate, influence, and enable others to be successful. So creating that sense of belonging is where people can really provide a piece of their identity to the group. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, is that we're wired that way. Mm -hmm. We want to do that. We want to, we want to be a part of someone else's life. We want to be a part of an organization. We want to do things that make a difference. So we already have that going for us. So the idea is not to screw it up along the way, but to actually create that environment where people say, yes, this is, this is, I feel a part of this. And, and how do we, we do it well we do it through the greetings we do it through the connections uh, we do it by listening to what others have to say we create uh, exchange of dialogue we uh, give people an opportunity to contribute in ways in which they may not normally have contributed i sometimes like to think of belonging and inclusion to kind of give you a, mm. a really an analogy of how that works is to consider receiving an invitation to a party so I'll send you, Jason, I'll send you an invitation to come to a party at my house. You know, you get that invitation and you're sort of like, wow, that's really cool. You know, like, gosh, he, you know, he thought of me, you know, I'm kind of included in, in what's going on. So I'm really like, I'm feeling like I belong. Yeah. And you get to the party and when you get there, I have to do my part to make sure that you feel welcomed. I have to make sure that you know, hey, here's where the the food is and, you know, here's where the restroom is. Here's some people. People I want to introduce you to. And by the way, yeah. we're playing music. And when that music starts, I want to invite you to come dance. The belonging part starts with an invitation and it concludes with an action of involvement. If you have that, then you truly will have that sense of belonging because you believe that you are valued. You believe that your contribution will make a difference. And it's like belonging kind of spills right over into value mm -hmm. in um, how that element actually works in the concept of cohesion. I really appreciate that explanation and the metaphor. Thank you. One thing I do appreciate about your book are some of the metaphors, the acts of the book, um, the the dance floor, things like this. For those of you who, when you get out and read it, you'll you'll know what I mean. But when we're talking about belonging here and this metaphor um, of the party invitation, I do have a question for you. Now, most of us out there in our work environments are, are already in some kind of culture, right? We're not starting our startup from scratch tomorrow. I mean, some of us probably are, but most of us are not. Maybe there's a difference between a new employee and helping to establish that belonging with them and kind of putting things together in flight already. Does that make sense? Right. No, it really does. And new employees sometimes are the hardest to, to bring into the culture because they're not a part of all the stories and mm. all the rituals and customs that you've already had. So, you know, they remember uh, celebrating uh, Millie's wedding and, you right. know, when Bob uh, won a fishing trophy and got to share it or whatever happened, uh, you know, they have all those stories and those connections. And that's why Good I point. always talk about connections before content. So when you have new employees who come into an organization, uh, one of the things that I suggest that you do is you ask them uh, to tell you something about themselves that's not on their resume. And for all the individuals who are going to be in that team or that group where they are, is that they would do the same thing, share something that is not on the resume. And you start to find, oh, I connect here or I connect there. I travel, I enjoy a hobby. 
um, I have children, I, I have pets, I, something, whatever it is that can actually link us together so mm -hmm. that we're beginning to really contrib contribute or really create what I refer to as our group mentality. So it's the, it's the mentalness of the group and you give a piece of your identity when you share information and then people share that information back with you, um, you do that. The other thing is I talked about greeting, but it's not just the hello, how are you? I should be more specific as a physical greeting. It's how you would interact with them. So for instance, would you do a fist bump or a high five or a handshake or touch elbows or um, whatever? I, I was just doing a session with a group and we were creating this cohesion culture within um, a variety of organizations. And so we had uh, a number of things that people came up with with their specific greeting that they wanted to do. And you know, one uh, group decided that it was the ankle touch. So instead of <laughs> using your hands and, and creating the, the welcome, it would be an ankle. So it's ankle to ankle touch. And I guess it would require a whole lot of stability. You know, you're standing on one leg while you're trying to right. make your connection. I have a hard enough time standing on both Just legs on trying two to legs, shake yeah. a hand with a person, <laughs> let alone trying to shake my ankle. But hey, that was their little group. And others had, um, you know, a variety of mixtures uh, between uh, touch their head, uh, rub their belly, uh, turn around three times, jump up in the air and then do a, a high five. You see, when you invite someone into that and now all of a sudden they know the secret handshake, they don't feel like an outsider. They really start to emulate this concept of, that I can belong and that you really want me to be there because you're telling me these things that would only be done maybe behind the closest of doors. And mm -hmm. um, it, it just really gives you a good feeling about it. Uh, belonging is really always going to be about your feeling. It's how you feel connected, the emotional connection you have to that organization and to the people. And without the experiences and without that information that's not identified as your role, do you get to um, experience it? And so the other thing, and I'll give you a, a third item, is that it's so important to separate your role from your identity. And mm. you give people an opportunity to understand the difference between the two. Uh, you may have a role of, I'm responsible for doing a report, um, I'm responsible for uh, completing a file. I do something on the computer. I sweep the floors. I file papers. I handle software. Whatever that is, that's your role. But your identity is who you are. And if you are able to express who you are, then that becomes important. Not only is it important for value, but it also creates that bridge between belonging and value. And on page 20 of the book, I talk about the seven attributes of an effective leader. And it's so that you now know what are some attributes, what are some characteristics, what are some things about me that represent my identity, such as being teachable, being compassionate, extending grace, seeking the truth, being humble, having purity of heart, meaning that you're authentic or that you make peace. And if you consider those attributes together and you start expressing them, then individuals will start to connect with you in ways in which you hadn't expected before. Taking me to school here. Uh, that's that's, <laughs> that's pretty powerful, powerful stuff. And I mean, I just have to tell you as a quick aside, Dr. Troy, that I mean, it's just cool to see how ingrained everything you're talking about is. You know, you obviously are living uh, and championing all this stuff because the way you are just firing it off is is really cool. So I do appreciate Thank that. You. Yeah, that, there's a lot of great stuff uh, in there about about belonging. Um, I am curious when you talk about the uh, rewinding just a bit. When we talk about including uh, a new member of a team, and and as you say, uh, including them in the secret handshake and, and things like this, in, in maybe sure. in some in some ways, maybe we're we're creating a new version of that because we have a new person on the team. What I was yes. going to ask you, uh, does this, does this mean we kind of have to, we should probably kind of go through this process anytime we go through a team change? Yeah. Anytime you add a new identity into the group, the dynamics change. Mm -hmm. So when you remove someone, the dynamics change, when you add someone, the dynamics change. And imagine if you've removed and added that there will be a dynamic change within the group. And sometimes you have to reset uh, for the group because um, depending upon the departure of the individual with the group. If it was a planned departure, 
then it, you know it may be okay to continue things the way they are. But if it's a sudden or abrupt departure, either due to an illness or maybe even worse, uh, then you may want to just level set and start the uh, start the process all over again. There isn't any rule that says that you can't uh, start over. Uh, I think what's important also in this uh, area of inclusion is asking people their opinion and. Mm -hmm. If you're the leader of the organization and you find that you start out conversations by bringing people together in a room and telling them what you think and then asking them what they think, then you haven't understood the concept of uh, that you focus on others first and then self. Because what you've demonstrated is that my opinion was now more important and more meaningful than yours. And it makes it challenging and difficult for individuals to speak up because what safety do I have if I contradict the, the leader is that individual going to think poorly of me? Will it impact my opportunity for advancement? Um, do they really want to hear what I want to say or are they just saying that to be nice? So if you truly want to mean it, then you have to act like you mean it. And that means you have to do those things that uh, that set it up for success for uh, the individual as well as for yourself. And so I always tell leaders that when you want to gain information from people, ask open-ended non-leading questions, and then let people have self-discovery. And uh, also two conversations don't always have to be one and done. Uh, sometimes you have to take a conversation to a certain point and then you stop and let people kind of marinate on it, right? Sort of think about it, noodle on it, whatever term you want to use to, to really back away so that they can bring their perspective again. That's sometimes very important because not everybody is impromptu. Not everyone can take an idea or a suggestion that they may think of in the moment and actually speak it. Sometimes they have to think through that process. And so you really just respect people for the way they uh, want to deliver information and the way you want to include them. Um, and certainly when people do contribute, um, you would honor that individual's contribution to what the conversation is. Even if they're off base, mm -hmm. you still honor their uh, information, their contribution, but you don't have to talk about it. You don't have to overdo it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot about being authentic in leadership that really has to come across when you're working with other individuals and people will feel more like they belong and included when they worked with an individual who is authentic. Uh, another way of really embodying this uh, opportunity for inclusion is truth seeking. Uh, that when we're going to be included, we're going to be included in the truth, not just my sort of half-baked opinion that I may have, that may be a belief that I have that's uh, somewhat sourced from a value that does not necessarily align with the organization. And as a leader, it's always important that the values that I speak, the beliefs I have, the attitudes I have, manage and work together for the organization, for what the organization's core values are. If not, then you have a total disconnect and you have a dysfunction. And here's an interesting statistic for people listening, that we spend over $7 trillion, that's T, trillion dollars a year globally for, for teams that are dysfunctional within organizations. So there is truly cost associated when uh, you do not operate in a cohesive manner. The other thing that you can also find is that cohesive teams are four and a half more times likely to communicate well with each other and share that communication beyond the scope of the entry from the senior leadership level. 91% of employees believe that communication works in an organization, but it only works from the top level to the next level. Mm. They don't believe that it gets all the way down. And so we have to emulate those behaviors that is actually going to change that so that the employee feels included. I'm included in the vision. I understand what it is. It may have been spoken in a way that's important for me, not just because of my education, but how it may, how it makes a difference in the work that I do. So those those types of things, I think, are some additional examples of how individuals can feel included as a part of that belonging. That's a lot of great stuff. I, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot going on in my mind here. But <laughs> when we get to the the last couple com comments that you were mentioning here, uh, Dr. Troy. You do suggest in the book, right, that there is a direct causation between cohesion and uh, productivity. I don't know if that's exactly the right yes. word, but um, can you speak a just a little more deeply on that? Because you started talking numbers and costs of uh, dysfunctional teams and, and you know how much we spend. 
can you can you kind of clearly outline it for us the relationship between cohesion and productivity sure so cohesion is a causal phenomenon which means that it's a cause and effect it's not correlational so you're not correlating information. So I think the first thing to help our listeners is to make sure that we understand the difference between causal and correlational information. Now we correlate data all the time, and I'm not suggesting after you listen to this podcast that Dr. Troy said you should not correlate information. What I'm trying to make sure you understand is what, how correlation works in relationship to causal. So in correlation, you create a statistical relationship between two items. So I'm going to show you a little bit through an example how correlational data works. So I'm going to ask you some questions. So are you ready? Oh, boy, I'm ready. Okay. So have you experienced a rainy day? Yes, I have. See how safe that question was? There was no harm in that question. <laughs> do you open an umbrella on a rainy day? Uh, I do sometimes, yes. Oh, sometimes. So you don't always open an umbrella on a rainy day? I don't. I suppose I'd have to have the umbrella with me. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, have you gone to the beach? Sure, I've gone to the beach, yes. All right, I'm not going to ask you what you wear on the beach. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you if you've noticed umbrellas opened on the beach. Ah, I have noticed umbrellas open on the beach, yes. And was it raining when those umbrellas were opened? No, I believe they were used to block the sun in that case. Right. So I can create a correlation between rainy days and umbrellas and umbrellas and sunny days depending upon how that data is brought together. But the greatest predictor of behavior is causal. And that's why we focus on this. So through the research, my PhD is in global leadership and entrepreneurship, and the dissertation was in group dynamics with an emphasis on cohesion. And what was studied and what was extended is 50 years of research that says that when people feel a sense of belonging, when they are valued or have value, meaning that my work is meaningful and purposeful, and I know that, and if I am participating in shared mutual commitments, I perform, and I perform at a level of engagement that we are looking for and we want from employees. We perform at a level that says we are helpful, we are active, we are vested, and we are eager. Hmm. And the type of performance that occurs in an organization will determine what that organization's work is. But what we do know is that of the increase that can happen, you can get up to a 50% increase in productivity and creativity from a team when they operate with those with those cohesive behaviors in place. Thanks for that great explanation. Uh, very clear as well. Thank you, Dr. Troy. I, I think so now so now everybody's thinking, great, I can I can go, <laughs> go get a cohesive, go make a cohesive cul cohesive culture, excuse me. Um, it sounds so simple when you say it the way you did, people have a sense of belonging and a shared purpose and things like this, right? They're going to perform. They're going to be, I mean, the way I hear it is they're going to be kind of more easily intrinsically motivated. And as long as we stay out of the way as leaders and don't find ways to demotivate them, that they are ready to go in that environment. I, I am curious, uh, talking about engagement, um, you did refer to a, a study in the book, uh, 12,000 journal entries from a variety of different employees. You make a comment in the book and it is, buying engagement doesn't last. Now, I know that people all over have different opinions of what human resources might mean. And I think that's largely uh, determined based on their experiences with human resources. Some have had great experiences where they're there to support the culture and, and do other things. Other places, they're afraid of HR. And it all depends on the experiences. But what, what are you getting at when you say buying engagement doesn't last on unlike a cohesion co gosh i'm going to have trouble with this unlike a cohesive culture so what i was referring to is that when you buy talent meaning that the only way you think you can woo talent to your organization is offering a higher value than somebody else down the street hmm. that what we know statistically and what we know from data is that money is not the number one driver for individuals to go to a new organization what really single-handedly drives people away from a company is the relationship or the lack of relationship they have with a supervisor. 
So as that relationship with the supervisor works, that they love the person that they're working with, they feel respected, it's really great, they're contributing, they're doing that, it's intrinsically feeding my inside values. Money is an extrinsic factor. And so basically we know through research that extrinsic factors have a very short shelf life. And so if you're buying an employee with money, then the likelihood is they're expecting you to treat them to things along the way, which might be increased buying power, um, newer toys, shiny objects. And so it really just fundamentally, I allow leaders to really think about a culture in this way, is that culture is built in how you treat people, not the treats you give them. So really focus on those types of things that build the individual up on the inside. Find out what it is that really motivates that individual. We know that there are three primary focuses of motivation based on McClellan's work from the 1960s, which is still relevant today, some 60 years later. And that is that we want to affiliate. So we have some motivation of affiliation, that's our belonging, of achievement, which is our value, and then our shared mutual commitments is a result of the power. And so do leaders only implement organizational power or institutional power, or do they operate with influential power? And where the greatest success of your cohesion culture comes in the shared mutual commitment is when the leader uh, demonstrates or uses influential power. And that is allowing people to self-discover and to do what is right because it is the right thing to do, not because I was told to do it. Let's talk a little bit about retention, which I, I know that, I mean, if we just zoom out, we're talking about elements in our workplaces that should lead to retention, right? But you have attention, attention. You have a talent retention model uh, that you outline in your book. And if I read correctly, a lot of this is based off of some of experience that you've also had within your professional life, in addition to your own uh, research. Uh, is that correct? In the South Carolina Federal Credit Union? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that is correct. And so when we talk about retaining employees, which we all know it's expensive, disruptive, culturally significant to lose employees, especially ones we like to have. I mean, are there specifics you can t speak to about some of the biggest barriers you have seen to retaining employees? To talk about all of this cohesion culture in in big sense is great and it's 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 a big ask right it's a long game i think um are there any specifics you can speak to about barriers to retaining employees that you've seen well let's just say when the leader is a jerk then you're not <laughs> going to have a great opportunity to retain leaders yeah. if the leader doesn't think of other people first so realistically the transformative principles of leadership create the basis for the foundation of a cohesion culture or the infusion of cohesion into your culture. And so these four elements for the leader specifically, the, so the barrier would be what stops this from happening. So what I think will be helpful would be to tell our listeners what are the things to do and then know that anything that you do that counters that would be opposite and probably not as effective. Perfect. So we'll speak for that positive. So as a leader, it's vision, telling people the vision and teaching it. It's not just talking about it, but it's actually teaching it. So a barrier would be is that the vision is held closely held to the senior leadership and it's not provided to others. Yeah. Um, and it has to be provided to others and you teach it in a way that's appropriate for them and the job they have. So let's say you want to move into an additional market. Um, so should you teach the vision of moving into a market? Yes. Uh, that would not necessarily be something held high in confidence unless the market you're going into is highly competitive or you want to be first into the market. So what your vision would be is not that you're expanding into this market, but that part of your vision is to expand into markets when it makes sense to do so. And this is what we would look for for the type of market that we would go to. In the teaching aspect of the vision, you're always explaining why. So often people are great at telling you what we're going to do but we fail to tell them why they need to do it or why it needs to happen. So that's part of that. Uh, another one, another barrier that happens is this inability to have good emotional intelligence mm. and to make sure that the individual understands how to manage their emotions and the emotions of others. And to really consider uh, two very important aspects of uh, emotional intelligence, and that is 
my self-awareness and my self-regard, and that's my self-regulation. So am I aware of what it is that I'm doing? Can I self-correct? Can I course correct before it happens? And many times barriers occur where leaders sometimes act in certain ways and they are told later that they acted like that and they had no idea that it was producing an unintended consequence. And so for individuals to really be on their game, they really to know, need to know how they're asking you know, how they're acting so that that comes across in a very positive way. You see, it's one thing when I know I made a mistake and I fix it. It's another thing when I don't know what I'm doing and someone tells me. Uh, so remember, anyone can apologize when they've been louded out. But the opportunity is, can I be aware of that and actually make that acknowledgement first? Uh, then is social connectivity and my social interactions. And am I an individual who knows how to treat people? Do I think about those attributes that I spoke about earlier, and do I embody the values of the organization, uh, specifically in things like integrity, uh, truth, uh, honesty, you know, those types of things. What are the moral character that I have? And the barrier and the breakdown can be when the leader says one thing but does another. So when the leader has high integrity, but they find that they're cheating on the side or they're fudging a number or they don't come clean on that they didn't get the report done and what was the reason for not doing the report and they make up some half-baked answer. And those things can become barriers to individuals because they observe and see those behaviors and therefore it, it changes the interactions. Mm -hmm. And then lastly is a trusted environment. So they have to have a trusted environment where people feel comfortable that they can speak their mind, tell you what's going on, do so in a respectful way, that you don't gossip around people, you don't, um, you know, you don't make people wrong for the fact that they may have a varying uh, opinion, that you know that you uh, counsel people in uh, private and that mm -hmm. you praise them in public. So all those actions and activities you do. So what I suggest to leaders is they put on their transformational vest. <laughs> it's vision and teach it, emotional intelligence, social interactions or connectivity, and trusted environment. And if they put on that vest, then they won't have to worry about the barriers. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. I, I'm curious now in, you know, you wrote the book a couple of years ago um, based on a lot of experience and research. The world has changed a little bit too in the last couple of years, hasn't it? Maybe on the fundamental level, things aren't different, but some of the means by which that we are connecting and communicating, especially in uh, knowledge, worker, knowledge worker environments where a lot of work has gone virtual, right? Yes. How does somebody more effectively deliver on those four keys you just pointed out when, when we aren't seeing each other face-to-face -face as frequently as we were before? Well, one of the things that I would say, first of all, is that culture is available for everyone, not just those under the same roof. Mm. And what we saw and maybe identified as the great resignation, I believe last year, 48 million people uh, resigned, and so we were making headlines about people resigning. But quite frankly, they didn't resign, so to speak, meaning that they didn't stay home, uh, lay on their couch, eat potato chips, and stream their favorite series. What that they did nice, was re though. that would, would be nice, right? <laughs> and maybe some of them did, or they did it for a while. But really, what we saw is that the individuals were recalibrating. So I call it the great recalibration. It's thinking differently about the work I want to do and how I want to do the work and where I want to do the work and with whom I want to do the work. And that big change when organizations realized it and decided to recalibrate their thinking. So remember the first attribute of an effective leader is being teachable. And will you learn something from what's actually happening? Do you learn something from the data or do you just keep bullying yourself right through because you think it's the best way to do it and you're not paying attention to what's happening right in front of you? So with this, with this recalibration concept came the opportunity for us to now say, well, how do we make our culture work when we're not under the same roof? Well, some leaders' answers were, well, we'll just make you all come together under the same roof because that was so much easier and that's the way we're, we've done. And, and we'll pretend uh, that the main reason that we have to do it is because if we don't, we won't have collaboration and we won't have um, individual sharing nuances and information. And I don't know, I just have to say a surprise to the US leadership population that we've been doing 
a virtual work around the world for years. I and know, right? we've not stopped scientific delivery of individuals working together and sharing their information and being open source. We've actually created open source technology that allows companies to build upon that technology and not have to have it specifically coded uh, for them. So we have all these examples, but for somehow when it came to people, we said, oh my goodness, the only way I know how to do that is if everybody's together under the same roof. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed my opportunities of helping leaders retain their talent by exercising some new ideas. So I'll give you two very specific examples that would happen. And the first thing I'll say is, let's make sure that you remember that how you treat a person in person is also how you should treat them when they are not in person. Great point, yeah. So if you welcomed an individual into a room with a greeting, then welcome people virtually with a greeting. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes you have to create that special greeting so that they feel included because everyone is now doing it. You wanna level set how things work in that regard. So one of the suggestions I remind folks is that Although you may have six or seven people who can be in a conference room and two or three people are online, my best suggestion is, is that if you're conducting a meeting, put everybody in on, on the computer and let everybody be faced equally on the screen. It really does a whole lot for you creating that, that sense that not one person or one group is better than another. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it allows the opportunity for people in the room to actually communicate for those individuals who are on the screen. And if not, you'll get sidebar conversations, you'll get people doing some one-offs, you'll get some you know, funny laughter or some things, and then people aren't included in the whole thing that's happening. And nobody wants to tell the joke after the joke has already happened because then it's not funny anymore. So you, uh, you kind of want to level set with that. Here are the two really great takeaways. Uh, one is to create a huddle. And now the huddle is a set the tone. It's a three to five minute meeting. Um, I recommend that you do it uh, several times during a month. Uh, you don't have to do it every day, but you want to set the tone. It's only two or three minutes, so you can find ways to set the tone for the day. And it's to really bring people together. Sometimes it can be inspirational or motivational that you would be providing some sort of information. It's kind of like if you think the huddle for a sports team. Mm -hmm. And I had people say that to me. I go, well, what do you think happens in the huddle? And they say, well, you call the play. I said, yeah, but you're setting the tone for the play. Hmm. So it's not necessarily about, oh, the work I'm about to do, but you're actually setting the tone. You're having an opportunity to bring the team together for unity before you open the doors and send them out. I'm yeah, sorry, you your teammates focus... drop the ball and you you tap them on the back and say, you're all yeah. good, you'll get the next one, right? Good the one, you'll get the next one. So you're, so you're doing that. So you have to decide the huddle and the huddle is done with everyone. And then the second part, now this is the one that really I'm not wavering on this one. This one has to be done every day and it's called a daily debrief. Hmm. And so I want to make sure that people are listening correctly because their definition of a daily debrief and what I'm recommending may be different. A daily debrief is a simple one word, one sentence response from every employee before they leave the day. You set it up for how it works. You ask them to send it to you electronically, maybe through your internal systems of communication, maybe email, instant message. If you allow text messaging to be a part of it, you get the text message. It has to be the responsibility of the employee to provide the debrief. You can even set it up where the leader says, on a scale of one to five, tell me how you feel before you leave. And the individual has a chance to tell you how you feel. Then the leader has an opportunity. Do they respond to every one of them? No, they don't have to, especially if there were a five, it'd be great. But if somebody says a three or a four, you may want to spend a few minutes to find out why was your day a three or a four. Get that background information. Now, the basis of all of this comes from work that was done by researchers called Ingerville and Kramer, and they wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review called The Power of Small Wins. Mm -hmm. And what they definitely tell you is that how you feel at the end of the day is more likely how you will start the next day. That is why you should always resolve communication. That's why you may have heard the adage or the parable or the proverb or the message that says, don't go to bed mad. Right. right. Make yeah. sure you resolve your communication so that you have a, not only a good night's sleep, but when you start the next morning, you're not starting with an animosity. 
if you are if you are upset with someone at the end of the day, I guarantee you in the morning you're still upset and thinking about it. Probably. <laughs> but if you've been able to clear it, be able to clear your mind, clear that responsibility, clear that, then you have a chance to start the next day fresh. And so that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that your employees are always starting the day fresh. And then when you get to the huddle, then their tone is already in a good space and you're not using the three or five minutes to kind of recraft what you should have done at the end of the day. And it gives you the res uh, opportunity to really get that inside information. And the reason that the huddle is done together is because we are building and feeding off that positive energy. Because remember, you always praise in public, you criticize in private. So if there is going to be criticism that may come from the day not going well, that needs to be in private. That's why you set it up as a one-on-one. -on -one. And so that it doesn't just become the leader's responsibility, you want to have a shared mutual commitment. That's why you have the employee actually be the one to tell you how they felt at the end of the day. And by the way, that end of the day, I also recommend it should be within a two hour window when the person leaves, because we do not want people thinking that all of a sudden this was a trick just so you could tell whether or not I was in my seat or not, whether I was actually yeah. doing my work up until the exact time before the whistle blew. You know, you want it to be a real genuine sort of experience for people. And sometimes you have to take away those cobwebs that people will build in their heads. So give them a nice window of opportunity to do that. So we've seen great success in organizations that have rolled out those two particular principles and they found it really being a game changer. And they've asked me too, they said, well, can I do a huddle and then do a team meeting for production? And I said, yes, but you have to open a door, close a door and open a door. So you have to make sure that you haven't commingled those two activities together wow. and they get lost. So you wanna make sure that you've done the huddle part separately from your production. And in that case, I would suggest that the huddle comes at the very end of the production because it's the last thing they'll remember before they actually start their day. Okay. Two great tactics. Thanks for sharing those. Um, it also strikes me those could work great without virtual, right? I mean, no matter what, those sound like great tactics. So Absolutely. But what they do is they give you something that will unify the group um, that happens to be virtual because yeah. now they're now being included. So I wanted to make sure that the examples were purposeful uh, for the individuals who are uh, away. I mean, uh, there's other little examples of things that you can do, like when you have uh, employees that work remote, do you ever invite them to lunch and actually eat on the screen while you're eating lunch and do your brown bagging and you sort of do that experience? Do you actually create a team environment? If everybody goes to lunch or three or four people go to lunch at 12 o'clock, does anyone call the person who's working remotely and say, hey, would you like to join us uh, for lunch? We're all going to bring our our yeah. uh, lunch in brown bags today. We're having a brown bag lunch and we'd like you to be a part of it. Just yeah. imagine the things that can happen in an organization when you extend your culture. That's why I really am very strong when I say that culture is built on how you treat people, not the treats you give them. Mm -hmm. All those examples you're talking about really speak to the belonging aspect. And when you do have teams that are partially in person and partially uh, remote, you've got the, as you've said earlier, the potential to favor favor one or the other, depending on where the managers or the leader, however you want to think about this, is situated. There's so many great things here, uh, Dr. Troy, thank you. And there are a lot of other questions I would like to ask, but in the interest of time, um, <laughs> we're going to move ahead. And I, uh, I've got one question I ask every, every guest uh, on the podcast, and it is, um, what is something that you have learned recently? I'll start out by saying one of the best things I ever learned was that I don't have to know everything. Hmm. Um, the other thing I learned is I don't have to do everything. Hmm. And it's a, there's really this great opportunity. And I think that what I've been learning and working with individuals is not that I didn't know this, but it's becoming more and more important that people want to be seen. Hmm. And to be seen, it means that they want to be heard. And that if we truly want to manifest change in our social interactions with people, then we have to give them a reason to stop yelling. Hmm. People yell when they feel that they haven't been seen or they haven't been heard. What we need to do is open dialogue with individuals and we need to learn from them. We need to learn their experiences. We need to learn about their cultural differences and similarities and really come to an enlightening aspect where we don't think that because a person thinks differently than us that they become an enemy. Mm. That what we can do is, is understand that those individuals who think differently think so because of 
their past and their life. And if you can focus on them first and then self, then you can set up a, a sort of a process by which they can reciprocate that mm -hmm. and they will then think of you and then themselves. And when we have really worked in that way, we, we can just really change so many things about the way we interact in the world and, and the peace that we can make. And that's why I include peacemaking as one of the key attributes of a leader. And I teach our grandchildren all the time. And I say, leaders don't fight, they work it out. And actually got them to do a little rhyme that they, that they speak. And every time that they get into an argument with each other, I say, now, what is it about leaders? And then they go, oh, you're right, leaders don't fight, they work it out. And, but they understand that concept and with that reinforcing, uh, they'll do it, they'll figure it out. Very cool, Dr. Troy Hall. You are a researcher, author, uh, consultant running workshops with people and organizations. For those listening today who are interested in the book or your works or wanna get in touch with you, where, where should those folks go? Well, they can get the book on Amazon. It's Cohesion Culture, Proven Principles to Retain Your Top Talent. Uh, ended up was a bestseller and we're still selling copies today. So I'm very excited about, about that uh, part of the program. And then to connect with me, it's real simple. On social media, it's DR Troy Hall. And if you want to find out more about what I do and schedule an appointment with me, it's drtroyhall.com. And then just go to the schedule tab at the top right of the website. Thank you so much for your insights, uh, for your wisdom, and all of the uh, the great uh, suggestions you've brought to the discussion today, Dr. Tro Dr. Troy. It's really uh, my honor to have you on here and uh, appreciated the conversation. Well, thank you, Jason. You know, I just leave with my mantra, and that is, you don't have to know everything. You just need to be teachable. Thanks so much, Dr. Troy.